When it comes to international masters, the majority of chess fans would agree the strongest player to ever compete under the IM title was Rashid Nezhmedinov. He would rack up impressive wins over the likes of Mikhail Tao and Lev Polievsky. However, there may be another man who is more worthy of being known as the greatest international master to ever live. His name? Emery Tate. Just a warning, the following game is not for the faint-hearted as you're about to witness one of the most devastating sacrifices you will probably ever see. D4. By the way, today Emery is playing with the black pieces and is playing against a Dutch grandmaster by the name of Spike Ernst, who is rated 25-22, so a very strong opponent. Tate plays the move knight f6, we see c4, we see c5, this is known as the Benoni, d5, very standard, and here Emery normally plays the move b5, known as the Benko Gambit, and this is what his opponent was probably preparing for, but off the bat we see the move e5, which is known as the Czech variation, which probably came from Czech, hence the name Czech variation. Knight c3 and d6, so now as you see Tate is is kind of building this nice structure what complements this light squared bishop we see e4 and g6 so take going for a somewhat of a king's indian approach bishop d3 and knight b to d7 g4 and this move g4 is more of an emery tate move of anything flying up the g pawn right up the board and this move may seem somewhat weakening but it actually does a very nice job of restricting black's mobility and if this pawn is not attended to emery could be in serious trouble and Emery understands that this pawn on g4 may be a bit of a nuisance to him, so plays the move bishop e7, which may seem a bit weird considering he played the move g6 to put his bishop on g7, but now he's gone bishop e7. The idea behind this is that in the occurrence of a move like g5, then Emery will be well prepared in breaking with the move f6, and Tate's opponent, being a strong grandmaster, has understood that this bishop no longer controls this diagonal, so decides to put his bishop on h6 and now black can no longer castle as it would be illegal as he would be castling into check so by this move bishop h6 he has somewhat pinned emery's king in the center of the board so there's a lot of strategy in this game a lot of strategy in chess and now emery decides to switch his attention from the king side of the board to the queen side of the board and plays the move a6 now h3 just defending this pawn on g4 and emery has had a bit of a change of mind and decided that this bishop is just too annoying and he wants to get his king to safety so he goes bishop f8 and white does not exchange here instead retreats it to the e3 square and if you notice here one of the reasons why white did not exchange this dark squared bishop is because it is his good bishop this is white's bad bishop as all the pawns completely just block all the squares it can access but this dark squared bishop can go to a lot more squares as the pawns do not block its way and here emery wants to do something about this pawn on g4 so plays the move h5 really asking it a question here you see the move g5 and now knight h7 so emery is attacking it with two pieces for that reason the move h4 is played and now bishop g7 so emery making a bit of a home here eventually he will break out of this almost kind of jail cell a3 and now castles and one thing that emery has going for him here is that his pieces are probably more developed than white's as white still needs to castle um and still needs to get his knight into the game and after this move castles white decides to develop this knight to the e2 square and now emery goes f6 really trying to almost break out get his pieces into the game and try get some more activity in his position queen d2 just adding more defense to this being a bit annoying fg5 anyway hg5 opening up this rook and if we just pause and look at black's position here then we would know that white is doing a fairly good job of restricting black on the king side black doesn't have too much play on this king side so if emery wants to make progress in his position he has to look elsewhere and comes up with the move rook B8. But now white races Emery to the queenside action and opens it up with the move b4. So trying to outspeed Emery, but here he goes b6. So in the occurrence of an exchange, black will be fine because we'll have the rook on this nice open file. So white decides not to take here and just plays rook b1. And now we see Emery just slides rook back to the a8 square. And now white makes a blunder. And you can try pause the video and find the absolutely disgusting tactic Emery Tate finds here. Um, this is probably one of the nastiest sacrifices I think you'll Ever see. So if you did pause the video and you found it and you have literally never seen this before, then the move is rook 
Rook, Rook F4. I honestly didn't even know things like this were possible. Um, in the game, this Rook was taken. Taken? In the game, this Rook was taken. I just want to say, the idea is very simple. It's simply just to take this pawn, but at what cost? So, this Rook was taken in the game, and now E F4. So, taking back and also attacking this Knight. If the Queen were to take this pawn on F4 with a move like Queen F4, then oops, this Knight and this Bishop, bang takes, check, and uh, white would be losing here. So after this move, EF4, if white were to take here, then remember, this knight is hanging. So you have to do something about this knight. So now knight G to E2. But now knight E5 really coming in here. Yet again, if this pawn is taken with queen F4, then this knight hops to the D3 square and takes this bishop. So after this move, knight E5, you cannot take this. But there is a big threat here. And there's a threat of the move knight F3, checking this king and winning this queen. So for that reason, white steps out of this deadly fork and plays the move king d1. But now it just gets worse because queen g5. Picking up the material, here the king runs again to the c2 square, but now b5. And it may seem a tiny bit complex to you, but it's actually not that complex. Let me break it down for you. Here black is threatening to simply take here and trap this bishop. Notice how this bishop has nowhere to go. So while black here is threatening to take this, and if this pawn were to be taken, like with this, then this pawn pawn comes up and goes here and wins the bishop again. So going back a bit, after this move b5, you cannot take here and there's also a threat. So we see the move king b3, vacating a square for this bishop on the c2 square and in the occurrence of an exchange, then white can also take back. But this move king b3 is not the best move because now black plays another great move and plays f3, attacking this knight and also attacking this queen. But it may just seem like a queen exchange to you. This queen was taken in the game and now knight g5. So what What's all the fuss about? This knight is being attacked, so knight f4, but now we see the move knight d3. The only defender of this bishop was this knight, so knight d3, and now we see the lovely move bishop c3. And not taking back here, because after a move like knight e4, black would be doing just too well. Black's already up two pieces of material, so white tries to complicate matters and plays b c5. And remember, this bishop is still under attack, so if you take back this pawn, then your bishop's gonna be hanging. Bishop d4 now, getting it to safety, but now takes. And after knight e4, black is up one pawn, but black does have the better position here, but it has to be very careful because white has some practical chances. Rook b to e1 was played here, attacking this knight, but now bishop f5, developing the bishop whilst also defending this knight. Uh, rook a4, but now bishop f2, double attack. So after takes, uh, not taking back, but just releasing a bit of tension first with check. King c4 was played, and now we take. And here the move rook e7. So Tate has three passed pawns here, but white does have some passed pawns uh, for himself. It's going to get quite tense. And here Emery goes knight g4, disconnecting this rook from this rank. So rook h1, and now f2. And now this pawn is very close to promoting. King d4 was tried in the game, but now rook d8, putting more pressure on this pawn on uh, d6. We see rook c1 but now knight h2 and how do you stop the queening here white plays a deadly trick rook c7 and if you queen now then oops you actually can fall into a draw this position would be full, fully blown drawn, and you've got to keep doing this, and after like rook f7, you've just got to keep repeating, um, and even if you go accidentally, even if you go here, after the move like rook e7 and king f8, there's a checkmate. So you have to be very careful here, um, hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but basically the idea is, there's a draw, um, if you were to promote the queen. So going back after rook c to uh, c7, here if you promote, there's a forced draw, and you can even maybe lose. Here, instead of promoting, Emery finds another brilliant move and goes bishop d7 and after this the dutch grandmaster resigns because there is nothing for him to do if this bishop were taken with a rook here then after a simple exchange and we promote so just going back a bit after bishop d7 disconnecting the threat of the draw because that was the threat here so that is the end of the game i've got a video right here i think you might enjoy thank you for watching have a good day